Hello, traders. It's Saturday, November the 2nd. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com, here to give a market wrap-up for the past trading week, and more importantly, an outlook for what we can expect in the trading week ahead. We're just coming off an exceptionally volatile week in terms of the scheduled event risk, both in terms of data as well as thematically, and yet that wouldn't necessarily render the enormous reversals or even momentum that one would usually ascribe to that degree of activity. Uh, would that mean that when you are more concentrated and there is less to draw our attention into different uh, directions, perhaps it's better, easier uh, to actually establish that consistency. Well, we will see because conditions do change in the week ahead. But before we get into our conversation, start to look at the areas of the market that are more interesting, just give the risk disclaimer that we have a 10 second look over and then we can dive right into it. Okay, so the thing we're going to start off with next week is very tuned into the big picture. Uh, how is risk trends or how are risk trends oriented? It is difficult to argue with the risk on that we have definitely seen through the end of this past week. Now, of course, my favorite measure of risk trends is also uh, arguably the most amped up uh, sentiment measure that you can find. In fact, in, in, comparis, in comparing so many other risk-oriented assets, the S&P 500 or U.S. equities tend to outpace almost everything else that has a risk orientation to it. Now, I'm not talking about the thinly liquid. I'm talking about the very liquid and uh, thematically relevant. Uh, so whether you're looking at global equities relative to U.S., whether you're looking at emerging markets, junk bonds, carry trade, commodities, and other asset classes that tap into sentiment, they are still substantially lagging what you get from the incredible run from the S&P 500 or the Dow or the NASDAQ. And to really put home the uh, the milestone that this sets, the, the torchbearer status, this managed to not only move to a record high, but it broke. So there's a gap there and it was a solid candle with no tail. There are no wicks, which means that it opened at the low, closed at the high. All right, that is a really uh, reinforcing enthusiasm. The problem is that it's it's really uh, over levered in terms of actual speculative positioning, uh, and you can see that in the actual leverage that the market maintains. Uh, but it's also leveraged in terms of the relative backdrop that it has from other risk-based assets. So. For example, I've talked a lot about the ratio that I like to set to other risk-based markets, and let's make them very equivalent. This is the S&P 500 relative to the VEU. So this is a rest of world equities measure. And if I were to take it up to a weekly chart, this is your ratio. You're pushing a record high here too. So it's not an equally distributed appetite for risk. It's rather a concentrated appeal for certain areas of risk. And that seems to be US equities. Now, does this mean that it's impervious? No, no, not at all. It means we just need to be more mindful about how enthusiastic we are when something like the S&P 500 garners good bullish traction. Does it mean that I'm necessarily going to have an easy and persistent view of risk appetite for carry trade, for example? Dollar yen is what we were talking about, uh, stationed there off of 109 until it pulled back this past Thursday. Clearly, it did not translate into this particular area, which traditionally follows risk trends. It means we need to be selective and we really need to look at the backdrop. Now, I am certainly a pessimist of what this represents uh, because it, uh, the fundamental influences the relative underperformance of other asset classes. I don't like uh, the, the non-uniformity uh, of this performance. But it's also just the enormous amounts of complacency that are here. Uh, now, if you look at how people perceive risk trends, uh, this is actually uh, something that I asked of traders going into the end of the week. How many were holding uh, a risk exposure, whether long, short, or whether they're not at all? Thankfully, most of you are not holding uh, risk-oriented exposure. And that means anything that is extraordinarily sensitive to risk on or risk off. 
but 29% were long risk, 32% were short risk. Into the weekend, where there's no liquidity, and if something goes wrong, or right, you don't have an opportunity to jump. Very dangerous. It is certainly a gamble, in my opinion, but uh, to each their own. Now, in terms of how people are uh, positioning for this uh, in, in practical terms, this is how retail traders, uh, this is through CFDs, IGs, C, uh, CFD traders, uh, are positioned. They're net short uh, almost to an exceptional amount, the farthest I have going back to November 2018. Uh, net short very heavily uh, and, and just an outright exposure of the short interest as you see here. Not necessarily a surprise. Uh, the sentiment uh, is not necessarily echoed as readily when you look at the longer term futures traders. Uh, their net positioning for the S&P 500 futures, the big contract, no, I have it here somewhere, is not nearly as extreme. Maybe I don't. Oh, there it is. All right. They are much more, uh, we'll call them restrained in their views. All right. No surprise there. Uh, there is definitely a lot more restriction in that kind of uh, net long risk. But the thing is, this is a big contract, S&P 500, and there's not as much uh, open interest here. If you look in another very popular nowadays risk uh, trade, volatility, and we know volatility is very popular because the amount of trading that goes on in, uh, well, VIX futures, but also the likes of VXX or all other volatility based indexes, the VXX short term volatility index dropped to a new, uh, new low, most likely going to be looking at another split here relatively soon. Uh, it's probably a sign that this was perhaps not priced properly but we'll, not, we'll save that for another discussion. How futures traders are positioned behind the VIX, they are pressing and they've actually exposed themselves through this past Tuesday to a record net short position. Now that means that there are a lot of people that are actually shorting VIX a record amount and a net basis. How much further can VIX go down? Not much, but that's not necessarily what they're there for. Uh, they're also there uh, in options trading uh, for the expiration. Uh, so you can take advantage of uh, a market that goes nowhere uh, as long as it stays low. This is probably where most of the interest actually is. But that, even that is extraordinarily presumptuous that it's going to stay this low. That is pressing the bounds of speculation. That is... Uh, not just taking a view of risk on, risk off, that is making assumptions that the markets will be extremely quiet in an already deflated market and sticking out with it at a record amount. It's very similar to the mentality that, that must come with buying into a market at a record high. Very presumptuous. The difference between the S&P 500 and the VIX is the S&P 500 has technically no, no upside restriction. The VIX, on the other hand, does have an upside uh, or a downside restriction. In fact, it's a more practical restriction in about the 10 area. So this is even more extreme in my estimations. But this is what the risk picture looks like. This is how traders are treating this market. They are incredibly complacent. Now this can work for times and it certainly has uh, worked to a certain extent uh, in what you see here. But eventually the risk reward imbalance is so extreme that one uh, small jolt of volatility given this much exposure will have an outsized impact and will more likely uh, than not cause something of a sentiment avalanche. So be mindful. We might crawl higher in the week ahead, but if we start to move lower in a significant way, it's going to probably turn into something of a, a, a tumble, an accelerated decline. So consider that. Now, in terms of what can help us and what can hinder us in sentiment orientation, risk on, risk off, uh, we need to keep watching those top themes that we've been discussing. Through the end of this past week, once again, the U.S.-China trade war progress, 
seem to be one of the principal uh, motivators of sentiment. Now this is the dollar CNH. We really didn't get closer to seven. It would be an, another milestone to cross the seven mark again. Uh, that would probably not happen unless we have like a, a legitimate uh, deal to work towards uh, and the removal of the currency manipulation uh, label that the United States has on China, which is a very high boundary, uh, or the Chinese authorities were actually just intervening on behalf of the USDCNH to uh, win or score points uh, with the uh, US counterparts. But if you're looking for something else that might be a little bit more enthusiastic, the FXI, this is a Chinese ETF, a popular one outside of China. Uh, and as you can see, it pushed to its highest level since the end of July. Now, what was so encouraging here? Well, we actually had from Chinese officials uh, remarks to suggest that they had essentially achieved quote unquote, in principle, a consensus with their US counterparts on uh, presumably the phase one uh, trade deal uh, requirements. And the sticking point there was reportedly the, uh, un the United States demand uh, to purchase or for China to purchase about 40, 50 billion annually in agricultural goods. If they moved on that, that's encouraging, but the concern that was voiced just the day before, that the Chinese uh, authorities are not convinced that the United States will stick to whatever it, it agrees to. It would uh, turn another reversal like it did back in June uh, is definitely still a principal concern here. And it's probably going to be more of a headline sources say uh, kind of situation that we're going to be dealing with into next week. So if you expect this to be a, a clear and unadulterated driver or catalyst for risk trends, uh, a, some kind of improvement in the U.S.-China trade uh, situation, uh, it might be a stretch. In the meantime, we should still continue to watch the U.S. and E.U., uh, the U.S. has placed tariffs on EU imports, particularly airplanes and agricultural goods, as uh, was allowed uh, for by the WTO. The EU takes uh, very serious problems with particularly the agricultural tariffs uh, and is still considering whether it's going to retaliate because the U.S. does not seem like it has budged on that uh, pressure. Uh, doesn't seem to be upsetting the euro USD uh, whatsoever at the moment, uh, but that could quickly become a principal driver, more so even than the US China situation. And even larger than that, out in uh, still two weeks away, November the 14th, uh, we're due the ruling from uh, President Trump on whether he wants to uh, go forward with tariffs on all imported autos. So that would be a trade war fight with Europe. Japan, South Korea, and numerous other countries uh, that uh, import or export their autos or auto parts uh, to the United States as one of the key markets. So keep that in the back of your mind as well. Now, another theme that is significantly lower on the scale of support uh, as a driver was monetary policy. Uh, monetary policy was not a huge motivator this past week. The FOMC was a big a big ramp. Uh, we did have the Brazilian central bank to cut rates. The Bank of Canada softened its tone, suggesting it could go for easing. The Bank of Japan is always dovish, but they're getting to the point where it's actually just being read as desperation. And I think increasingly this is the kind of sentiment that you're getting with all monetary policy. I question the effectiveness of monetary policy, and I think this going forward will be one of the key talking points even in common or normal trading circles, not just in our, our more wonky conversations. Because it was and has been the, uh, the uh, equation for most people that a central bank, a major central bank cuts rates, it gives lift to capital markets. Or they pursue a new QE that gives lift to the capital markets. And there was good reason to expect that because that actually did play out in market performance. Stimulus, purple line, and S&P 500 is a benchmark for risk trends performance here. That is not happenstance, that is causation. One caused the other. But the problem is, there's only so far this tool can go, and numerous central bankers, numerous uh, external influences like the Bank of International Settlements, the Central Bank of Central Banks, have warned that we're starting to reach the limitations of monetary policy. The question for us and trading is when do the markets start to 
recognize that, and that is their principal operator. That's not clear, but that is something that we should not fall back on this as being a key catalyst. It might provide some buoyancy that's already there, so it might stabilize something like the S&P 500, but like you see in the dollar yen, for example, the yen crosses do not continue to depreciate, or sorry, yen crosses rise, yen consi consistently depreciate because the Bank of Japan keeps saying they're going to cut rates even further or entertain the constant uh, QE program, which they are. That is not affording the kind of continuation that we've expected, much less the economic influence. So the real risk is when markets start to see that the, the support that's been uh, essentially uh, thrown behind these markets from monetary policy is no longer reliable. Then we have a serious problem. Now, in terms of monetary policy over you know, the coming week, uh, I will be watching a few updates. In particular, I will be watching on the euro side the influence of the Monday statement from Madame Lagarde, who is now the ECB president. This is her first, first official speech in this role. We want to see what she has to say because there is a lot of pressure and there are there are some rogue hawks amongst the very dovish bank overall. If she doesn't address this and doesn't address it uh, very directly, this is probably going to lead to a rift that's going to echo for uncertainty around the euro. There are two things that I really watch for the euro, uh, and that's as much for the euro USD, but really, if you want to get an unalterated view of the euro, I go to the euro Swiss. Um, it's going to be the uncertainties of trade policy with the United States. And of course, you always have that lingering under, undercurrent of uh, recession for certain euro area economies like Germany. But it's it's really the uncertainty of trade with the United States and monetary policy and how it's being perceived. Those are the two top themes. We're going to tap into this. Another monetary policy event is going to be the RBA rate decision. This comes out on Tuesday morning. The Australian dollar is in a very interesting position. Still, the Aussie USD, this is one of my preferred uh, dollar-based uh, pairs. I think, uh, actually, I can show you. Most people said that their favorite uh, technical picture was Euro USD. Yeah, I get it. Uh, oops. Uh, the Euro USD has that uh, channel, and it does look like it's nearing the top of a range and the midpoint of the 2019 range at about 1 uh, or 1220 or 1200. But I actually am more inspired by the Aussie USD, especially because it has also technical appeal to it. My preferred pair is actually the dollar peso, which had a big pullback after its Thursday rally. That's not a problem for me. I'm, I'm waiting to see what happens uh, uh, into next week if it bounces off that level. And further, if it's going to clear that 200-day moving average, which is just north of the uh, past 48 hours peak. All right, but uh, the Aussie USD is near a very noteworthy technical boundary. It's dealing with the RBA uh, rate decision. If the RBA is exceptionally dovish, it can be added as a catalyst to reverse down here. If they maintain their buoyancy, if they offer a little bit of, of perhaps a little, uh, well, there's still somewhat near the neutral level, but if their neutrality takes a little bit of a hawkish uh, lean, that could be enough to break this forward. Of course, Maintaining some moderate buoyancy and risk trends would also help that along. But if you want to isolate this outside of uh, risk trends or dollar influence, Aussie CAD, Aussie Kiwi, all right, definitely pairs that should be considered. Euro Aussie, that is definitely an interesting technical uh, setup here. Now, one other rate decision that I think will be more important from another perspective than its traditional will this rise or uh, sink uh, the currency for interest rate expectations, the Bank of England rate decision. Uh, this is going to come with the quarterly inflation report. Um, I'm going to be watching this as a Brexit backdrop uh, and whether they're going to update their projections now that there seems to be uh, a reduction in the no deal outcome potential, uh, but the uncertainty uh, and the stretched out uncertainty with the general election ahead in December. All right, so keep tabs on this. The pound is definitely not an easy currency uh, to trade now. It's not even going to have the same degree of volatility, uh, which has been capable of generating some short, very aggressive bursts of follow through. That follow through is gonna probably be a little bit more difficult to achieve. If you actually take a look here, uh, the pound-based volatility index has shown a significant drop-off. 
in uh, market expectation of activity. So take that as a sign of what kind of movement we can expect from the sterling. Now, one more theme that I think is going to be particularly important ahead is going to be GDP. This past session had a couple of indicators I thought were very important on GDP. Uh, the non-farm payrolls, obviously, was the market's favorite. Those payrolls were better than expected in a significant way, 125,000 versus 85,000 expected. But that doesn't really alter the course of the big picture of the U.S. economy. It doesn't uh, suddenly absolve us of fears of impending recession. Ooh, that's a nasty little tale there. Uh, Ignore the tail. That is definitely an error. Uh, the 10-year, three-month yield curve uh, is still struggling uh, for a consistent recovery above the baseline. Remember, just because you get back above uh, the uh, zero mark or it uh, it reverses its, its inversion does not mean that you're naturally going to avoid a recession risk. This is what happened last time back in 2000, 2001. It reverted back to normal, and then you hit into a recession. The recession risks are generally much more pronounced, uh, and they have good reason to be so. Uh, if you look at the other indicator that was on the docket this past 24 hours, surely let's look at the economic calendar. We had the ISM manufacturing report. That was 48.3. Anything below 50 is construed as a economic retren retrenchment, uh, so, so a contraction. I actually have this chart here. All right. This is very important because you're trying to maintain buoyancy without value. And you can do so through monetary policy, but as we talked about before, that can only go so far. Leverage only goes so far and increases the risk should it collapse. Uh, the manufacturing sector in the United States uh, was still well below 50. Uh, it was a little bit better in the previous month, but still below 50, which is contraction. What matters more is the service sector in the United States. It is much larger. Well, that piece of data is actually going to be coming out in the upcoming week uh, when we have the ISM service sector activity report on Tuesday. Aside from this, you have a bunch of economic updates. Now, will they level up to the same kind of impact, I uh, also missed the Chinese ones, uh, as what you saw from the GDP figures? Probably not. But don't write off what these can achieve as, as well as what it can achieve as a theme. All right. For now, we are heading higher in risk trends, and sentiment is buoyant, and complacency is high with certain speculative out, uh, outlooks. But these, these risks remain. It only takes a shift in attention from the market, a reorganization of priority, to suddenly say, well, we don't have the value to back this up, and start to see a slide, whether it be in S&P 500, whether that be in emerging markets, whether that be in carry trade. It, uh, risk aversion is going to be a, a more likely a great uni uh, unifier rather than risk appetite. As the saying goes, correlations go to one when risk kicks in. All right, we'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next rundown of these markets next week. Until then, I wish you all good luck trading out there, and I hope you have a great weekend.